Okay. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I believe I'm the, the last talker in this, uh, in this course. Is this? No. Is that, no? Another one? <laughs> okay. Well, anyways, um, Professor Pierre is not here, but I wanted to thank him anyway for having me here. And um, Professor Pierre said yesterday uh, he wished for him to have a class talking about um, where science meets entrepreneurship. And um, I, I would like to uh, identify with that. Um, some of the tips you got in the past week are things that I would love to hear before I started my entrepreneurial life. Uh, so I, I hope that uh, those of you that are considering uh, pursuing an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial life will find this course uh, beneficial. And those that um, think they won't and might uh, end up uh, in the business world will remember these uh, lectures as well. Anyways, um, before starting, um, I'll say a few words about myself. I'm a scientist that crossed the lines uh, to the borders of uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, I'm a, a biologist, started, uh, graduated uh, from the Weizmann Institute of Science. Four years ago, I founded a company called Vicoy Nanomedicines, and I would like to tell you my story. And um, uh, first, let's start with something a bit provocative. So uh, let's talk about risks. Actually, let's talk about the incredibly um, dystopic, catastrophic risks that uh, might uh, destroy, destroy this, um, uh, our civilization. So how may humanity perish? What do you think? Is it uh, an ice age or um, uh, global heating? Maybe you're envisioning um, um, a nuclear catastrophe of some sort, or maybe a rock falling from the skies. Well. All these are plausible scenarios, but there is one which is uh, very plausible and not every day we're giving um, um, a serious thought to it. So I would like to take you to um, a real event that happened um, less than 100 years ago. Uh, the occurrence is the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, uh, 1919. So uh, these years are mostly uh, known for being the days of World War I. World War I was a, a catastrophic event. Um, about 19 million people perished in just four years. However, uh, less, uh, less uh, publicized um, is that in the same time the, the Spanish flu uh, took place and 25 million people died within 25 weeks. Moreover, 40 to 100 million people died within two years. So. Um, this is much more than the, all the casualties from both all sides from the uh, World War II. A quarter of the US population was sick. Entire cities was wiped out um, globe wide. And three to 5% of the world population perished. Now, you may recall the avian flu pandemic and the alarm we had uh, in the world. Why was that so um, um, alarming? It's it just uh, a bird um, uh, sickness, right? Just a um, bird pathogen. Wrong. Uh, this bird pathogen was um, alarmingly similar to the Spanish flu pandemic. So this strain, if it just mutate a bit further, might be yet again the Spanish flu. Are, aren't we better off a hundred years uh, from the Spanish flu if such a thing would happen again? No, actually we're worse off because now, uh, with a more dense population worldwide and international flights going everywhere, it's completely impossible to uh, contain an outbreak like that. So uh, a de uh, the death toll of uh, a new Spanish flu would not be in the million uh, uh, people, but probably in the billion people um, rate. We wouldn't want to get to these scenarios. So. Um, don't take it from me, uh, take it from Nobel Prize laureate Joshua Lederberg, who said that the, bigel, the biggest uh, single threat to man's continuous dominance on this planet is the virus. A virus. Okay, so uh, let's, let's look at what, uh, a few viruses that we know of. HIV is a virus, influenza, dengue fever, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, polio, papilloma, rabies, even biowarfare agents like Ebola and smallpox, all viruses. Now, viruses are not just the cause for viral uh, pathologies. Viruses are also indirectly um, the cause for many uh, other types of pathologies that usually we don't associate with them, like cancer. A lot, a lot of types of cancer are associated with viruses. One, one of the most uh, famous ones is papillomavirus and, and cancer, but 
HIV causes cancer, herpes virus causes cancer, and many other viruses are uh, either proven or suspected of being um, uh, carcinogenic. Autoimmune diseases. Um, many times the immune system is aggravated so much by a viral infection that uh, even after the virus is eradicated from the body, we're left now with an aggravated immune system that attacks the body, uh, bodily tissue. And maybe even psychiatric diseases. And there is uh, a few evidence that microorganisms in general and viruses uh, included are the cause for psychiatric diseases. And maybe in the future we'll find out that maybe uh, something like the um, um, uh, anxiety or depression, which are plagues in the Western world, are um, microorganism uh, diseases. There is a virus called Borna virus that might cause a depression-like symptom in horses. So if horses can be depressed and after a while suicidal and uh, jump off cliffs due to a virus in their limbic system and the brain, why can't humans? So obviously with uh, such a big problem, we must have something good in our arsenal, right? So we're going to the doctor and we're saying we're, we're feeling bad and the doctor says you've got a virus and you should probably get some chicken soup. So chicken soup today is uh, um, maybe the standard care for viral infection. And it's quite absurd because this, as I showed you, is one of our biggest uh, threats to mankind. So is this the only thing that we can do uh, with viruses? Well, no, we do have some... Uh, uh, some uh, weapons in our arsenal. One is vaccines. Vaccine is a wonderful thing to have. If you can get a vaccine that actually works against a virus, that's the best case scenario. It's a prophylactic, of course. You need to give it to a healthy pe person before infection is, uh, uh, has already started. And uh, there is only a handful of vaccines. And even uh, a subset of that is, is a really good vaccine, a vaccine that will give you a, a lifetime protection. Most vaccines, such as the flu vaccines, are not really good vaccines. You need to get a shot every year, and even then you're not getting a full protection. So what happens if you're already sick with the virus? Then usually there is nothing to do. In the very small uh, uh, number of viruses, we do have a few cocktail drugs. And I put this cocktail uh, glass here like it's a cocktail. It sounds like a fun thing to have, but actually these are very toxic drugs uh, with uh, adverse effects. Basically, these are enzymatic uh, inhibitors, uh, viral enzyme inhibitors, that inhibit the virus uh, enzymes within the infected cell. Now, this is a bit too late, because if a virus is already inside the cell, damage is already done. We need, uh, uh, and this is a damage control approach more than anything else. So, uh, this schematic here describes any viral infection, really. Uh, you see uh, the viruses are uh, very elaborate nanostructures. Uh, actually, the um, most com complex nanotechnology in the world is not man-made. It's nature-made, and that's viruses. Uh, they're, they're about 100 nanometers in size. The very small ones are 20 nanometers. Um, they, hide, they enter into cells, hijack their machinery, turn the cell into a, um, a virus factory, and then in, um, uh, butt out in the millions, maybe, maybe in, the in the billions, and start again. <clears throat> the perfect parasite. Now, having all this in mind, I would like to tell you about decoy nanomedicines, which I've started uh, four years ago. So, decoy is not just the name of the technology, the name of the company, it's also the name of the technology. Decoy stands for virus decoy, which is what we're doing. Um, we're creating traps. So, what does it mean? Same as if you had a mouse in your house, you would use a mouse trap. We're using virus traps. These are nanostructures, nanospheres or, or microspheres, depending how we construct them, that have the ability to absorb viruses in the bloodstream of patients before these viruses uh, entered into cells. Let's look at how this works. And here are a few uh, uh, figures from our patent application. Um, and I could tell you that um, a year ago, I would probably won't be, uh, w wouldn't have shown this uh, slide because it was still confidential, so you're among the first to see it. And what you can see here is this nanostructure is not your regular an, uh, nanoparticle. We're not talking about um, a gold bead or some other type of uh, nano bead that is uh, surrounded by a, a conjugate. This is a two-layered system. The outer layer uh, is a la um, porous lattice. Uh, you can see it over. Can, can we? Okay. Uh, you can see this buckyball here. It doesn't have to be a buckyball. It can come up in all kinds of shapes. The common thing is it has pores. These pores are uh, large enough for viruses to diffuse very readily through them. 
and the outer uh, cage is also decorated by moieties that uh, give it a, a longer circulation time, say polyethylene glycol, which you have, you have heard uh, before. P uh, PEG could be a uronic acid and other types of uh, uh, moieties known to the pharmaceutical world. The inner structure could be this bead, bead here, and this is decorated by conjugates. In this picture here, it's antibodies, but it doesn't have to be antibodies. It could be aptamers, ligands, uh, and different types of uh, materials that uh, the virus uh, interacts with. This cartoon here would probably tell the story even better. So what you're seeing here is the VQA construct, and this is a virus. And just for you to get a scale, this is a red blood cell. So this entire VQA construct is much smaller than a human cell. What, so what happens? Uh, the, uh, in uh, this magnification here, you can see the VQOI approaches, sorry, the virus approaches the VQOI particle, crosses through uh, the outer layer, and then meets the inner layer and is both bound, and if we choose to, uh, um, broken into debris. So this is uh, uh, a brand new uh, idea, a brand new uh, way to treat viral infections. But it's not just an idea, it's actually science in the making. So I would like to take you to a short stroll to our, our uh, laboratory. We're doing a, a collaboration work with the Barilan University in Israel. And uh, is there any chance to, uh, to dim the lights and then we can see better the slides? No. Okay, so trust me, if you don't see something, ask. Uh, and trust me in what I do describe. What you're seeing here is our particles. This is uh, SEM uh, footage. Uh, and these are traps. So the scale here says four microns, meaning that everything you're seeing here is smaller than a human cell. These particles have the ability to absorb viruses. And uh, here are a few more pictures of these. Uh, uh, no, actually the other way around. But thank you for trying. Oh, that's good. I, I don't mind closing all the lights. Um, whoever wants to take a nap, that's okay by me. So, um, oh, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to take a nap now. So, great. So, what you can see is uh, these are quite unique structures, and uh, they're also very beautiful. They're like microscopic corals. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, at one point that I want you to, to bear in mind that um, these particles are made from, we can make them from many different types of materials, and we don't, we, we're not just uh, saving this uh, as a potential, we actually did that and we explored different types of materials, sizes and shapes of this, uh, this notion. So in the past, uh, in the previous, sorry, in the previous uh, slide we, we used polystyrene. This is a quite a, a funky material that I wanted to share with you as well. This buckyball is made from DNA. So we're using DNA not as a genetic material but as a building block. This is a subfield of nanotechnology called DNA nanotechnology and we're using a very, uh, a, a rather uh, new technique called DNA origami. Whoever haven't heard of it, I, I uh, advise you to, to look it up. Basically, you can uh, manipulate DNA into any ar arbitrary 3D structure that we like by using uh, complementary strands of DNA. So just look at one bar of this buckyball. It's made out of many, many DNA strands complementary. And this is how it looks like uh, when we, we shot it. So once we have created these particles, what do we do with them? So first of all, of course, we incubate them with viruses. And you can see all the white spots on the surface of a single trap. I, I circled one for you to see more clearly. And what you can see, what you can see in this picture is um, tens of viruses interacting with uh, the trap. What you're not seeing in this picture is that uh, there are already thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands of viruses already inside the hollow sphere. Here are a few more pictures of these uh, um, traps capturing viruses. And even though now I'm um, um, covered with, uh, um, um, overflowed with uh, uh, um, contracts uh, and um, um, business uh, issues, I'm first and foremost a scientist. And I could tell you it was uh, a very exciting day for us to get these uh, results for the first time because this was never been done before. This is a, a pioneering work, capturing viruses in such a manner. Okay, so now that we have created these traps and shown that uh, they have an efficacy to viruses, we started a few very cost-efficient screening systems. Why do we need a screening system and why is it more than just an experiment? 
as I said, we are making these traps for many different types of constructs, from different types of materials, different sizes, different shapes. And we want to uh, screen all the space and see what works best for us. And we want to do it in a very cost efficient way because we are a startup. And startups have a lot of uh, energy and passion and um, they're uh, not as uh, abundant with cash. So we need to be very cash efficient. So what we did here is a very simple experiment. On the left you can see happy, healthy looking cells. These cells are uh, the way cells should look like. The cells in the middle are not as help, uh, happy and healthy. They're actually sick, dying, and most of them already died. This is because we incubated them with viruses. The viruses are too small to see in this light microscopy, but you can see that their morphology is quite different than the ones on the left. The cells on the right are cells that got the same treatment. We dripped viruses into their medium, but we did another thing, and that is to incubate them also with the vicoy traps. These dark spheres that you can see here indicated by arrows, these, these are our traps. Look how small they are in comparison to the cells. Now what you can see here is that the morphology of the cells here are much more similar to this, the healthy cells. Well, while I'm uh, asking you to appreciate this in a qualitative manner, we did something much more quantitative. We used a genetic modified strain of baculovirus that expresses GFP, a fluorescent protein inside infected cells. So the more the cells are glowing with GFP, the more we know they are infected with the virus. And these, these are typical results. What you can see here is the fluorescence of cells. So taking you into that very clear, uh, very fast, uh, the colors are just replicates. We did every experiment three times. And we screened for eight different types of vicoys in this experiment here. What we want to see is uh, bars as low as possible because low bars mean low uh, fluorescence, low fluorescence mean uh, low infection. Uh, this is the, the control, meaning uh, cells that are 100% infected. Anything above 100% is just noise. That will give you a sense of how noisy our system is. And look how good, uh, uh, how, how well uh, number five and number eight performed. They lowered the viral, uh, uh, viral uh, infection uh, remarkably. Number three, on, the, on contrast, didn't do such a well job. And uh, this is how we actually work. We screen, we see what works well, and we perfect on that, we give it a new name, and we start all over again. And after doing consecutive rounds of uh, these pr um, uh, perfection uh, iterations, we managed to lower the viral load by 97%, which is much more than we expected to, uh, to get in, uh, in this level here. So being very happy with uh, this initial in vitro uh, results, we moved into in vivo. And we used a, qu we used a quite uh, an unorthodox in vivo uh, system of insects, namely cockroaches. So uh, why cockroaches? Uh, cockroaches are very far from humans. Why would we want to do something like that? Well, first of all, as I said, we are a startup, and cockroaches are cheaper than mice. <laughs> and, um, and this is important. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not just a joke. Um, I'm very happy with this uh, decision because since we decided to go with insects, um, we could get m many more data points that I if we could go into mice. And this is an uh, um, important, uh, uh, in important take home for you uh, from, the, from this talk. If you get a chance to uh, have a very cheap system, even if it's uh, not as good as the more expensive, go for the cheap because uh, it's not just saving time, it's creating more data. Now, we decided to go on cockroaches after we defined exactly what the question is. And the question at this point was not if we can cure people. Of course we want to cure people. The question is, can we capture viruses inside a living organism? Once we defined that that question is actually to prove the concept, show that this has actually a chance, a fighting chance in any organism, then choosing any organism, even an insect, makes a lot of sense. So what we did here is we injected cockroaches with viruses. Here you can see a, a roach getting a shot. And we, uh, uh, after infecting them, if we just leave them be, after two days their hemolymph, their equivalent of blood, starts to glow with GFP. Now if we inject them also with our traps, then again we can see a remarkable reduction in uh, the fluorescence, meaning we capture viruses in their bloodstream. Again, the same rationale, the higher the bars are, the more infected they are. 
Uh, these are uh, control, meaning 100% of infection. These are uninfected, meaning this is zero, really. And you can see, again, the same, the same results. Number eight did very well. It's the same number eight from the last slide. Number four, number one did also very well. Remember how poorly number three did? It's, again, the, the, the least performing uh, VCOI, but then again, better than no, no treatment at all. So this is taking us to the next level. We created more value now. It's not only that we know how to create these particles and not only that we can show that viruses interact with them, not only that we can show that in vitro, we already show that in vivo. Yes, in a very strange model, but this is already better than cells. Moving on to mice, we did a, a very uh, preliminary test. Again, we wanted to save on expenses. So what do, how can we use a very small experiment, just 20 mice, and get something valuable. So we, we actually tried to fail. Why would we do that? We wanted to see if there is any um, um, red flag um, toxicity that we should be concerned of. So we used the, the largest type of traps that we have, the ones that might have some kind of size-related toxicity. And we didn't decorate it at all with PEG, meaning we wanted to the immune system to see it if it can and pick, pick it up. We shot uh, the, 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 uh, these uh, particles into healthy mice just to see if there is any morbidity or mortality as associated with it in elevated doses. And what you can see here is even that after, se after seven days of a uh, uh, spike, 100% of survival and no morbidity. So this told us that even though there is a lot of work still to be done in rodents, there is not something extremely concerning like the mice dropping dead after an hour. Okay. Moreover, we have uh, uh, created a computer model uh, that uh, enables us in Silico to perform thousands of computer analyses um, where we are changing in the back end um, tens of parameters, the number of cells, the number of viruses, the affinity, the number of traps, how many viruses could be engulfed, in, uh, uh, encapsulated inside a trap before it's filled. And all these uh, we we play, we actually uh, give a scenario and see what happens. So let's see if it works on this computer here. Looks something like, okay, you have to trust me uh, that it, it does work on other computers. Uh, what you can see, what you would have seen is all these uh, uh, dots and spheres are starting to move and collide and um, um, circles are cells, um, uh, points are viruses, uh, rectangles are traps, and we're measuring how, much, how efficient we are in capturing the viruses in this virtual space and um, pinpointing which experiments we should be doing. So this is another example of how to create many experiments, even if it's virtual experiments, very cheaply. Thousands of experiments without using a single test tube. Okay, so... Uh, to sum up the scientific milestones, we have constructed VCOI virus uh, traps. Uh, we are the first ever to do that. We have shown these traps to be uh, interacting with viruses. We have created a high throughput uh, efficacy screening uh, in vitro. We also did uh, an in vivo model of insects, screening both for efficacy, meaning success, and toxicity, meaning we wanted to see that the cockroaches don't die. We did another toxicity screening in vivo in rodents, and we have created this uh, in-house computer model. Now, as you have heard before, uh, we're all scientists, and we feel very comfortable in this. Uh, our comfortable zone is the science, the technology. But once you are uh, out of the academia and you're starting a business, the science is just one part of a bigger puzzle. So uh, without, without a solid intellectual property, you have nothing. And you have to guard your intellectual property uh, uh, with everything that you have because uh, no one will invest a good dollar in you if that investor does not believe that you can defend their, uh, their investment. So uh, by uh, intellectual property, I mean two things here. We filed both for a patent and for a trademark. So in the patent, we're now pending in the national stage, which is, which is the most uh, advanced stage of the patent application. We're pending in the United States, Europe, Japan, China, Australia, and Canada. This is a very, very ex expensive endeavor to, to file in all these uh, territories. We've also uh, got the rights for the VCOI name. So now VCOI Nanomedicines could 
um, officially say Vikoi is uh, a property of the company and no one else can use this name. Uh, we won some nice prizes along the way, uh, um, been in the media, uh, and I want to give you a, a short timeline of uh, how, it, how the past years looked like. So, the end of uh, 2010, October uh, 2010, I founded Vikoi Nanomedicines. We have secured three seed investments. Seed investment is up to a million dollars. We secured that from five different angel investors. We filed a patent, as you've heard before, um, um, by Iran. Uh, the regular, there are many ways to go on, on intellectual property, and that's a, a full lecture, maybe a full course, and I won't get into that, but um, maybe the most straightforward way to protect any invention is to go through three, three layers. The first is a provisional patent, then after a year the PCT patent, and then after a year and a half to go into the national phase and to uh, safeguard your patent in each and every territory that you want, and that's exactly what we did. We started a lab uh, in collabor uh, collaboration with the bar Ilan University, but we did that in a way that the collaboration is a service contract, meaning we're actually paying the bar Ilan University for the services. The bar Ilan University is not a part of the equity of the IP. They're not getting royalties for any future products. And this is something you want to bear in mind because uh, you probably get a lot of uh, uh, collaborations if you're not safe uh, um, with your IP and equity and sharing too much in an early stage. It's, uh, it's harder to do to keep as much of the equity and, and the IP in-house and not share it, but we have managed to do that. So we have started a lab and achieved a POC, a proof of concept that like I've showed you before. We're now in the process of uh, um, fundraising a round A investment. A round A is up to uh, say five million, up to seven million dollars is still uh, round A. And that's for completing the preclinical stage, meaning everything we need to do, to do before we can get into the clinical stage, the, uh, the human trials. Now, this, um, this is a, a, a new platform technology. This could, um, and we believe, uh, will revolutionize antiviral medicine. Um, it could be used in many, many different applications. Uh, so here are a few. Uh, human healthcare, of course, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, dengue fever is a, is a big concern. But animals get viruses just like people. So, um, Foot and mouth disease virus, Newcastle, avian flu, all these are uh, the, the nightmares of farmers. Uh, we have striked a licensing agreement with a company called Enzutic that licensed our VCOI technology to treat viral infections in lobsters and shrimps that get viruses just like the rest of us. Now, this doesn't have to be therapeutic. It could be also purification. Uh, blood products are contaminated with viruses. Today, there's no way to completely eradicate viruses from blood products, from plasma. Uh, so um, how about treating blood products with VCOIs and then taking out the VCOIs from the blood product before it's administered to the patient? But, uh, this is much easier to do because then most of the issues of toxicity, immunogenicity, clearance are completely irrelevant. We just need to show that we are able to capture the viruses effi uh, efficaciously from the blood product and then uh, eradicate it from the, the blood product before it enters into the patient. And uh, the fourth application is a bit different. Uh, notice that these three applications are using, using the VCOI technology for a, a contaminated uh, entity. It could be a, an infected person, infected animal, uh, a contaminated uh, blood product. But this could be also used as a short-term prophylactics. And I don't mean a vaccine. But say you have um, an intelligence, say it could be a military intelligence that a biowarfare agent like Ebola is about to de be deployed on general population or troops. You can now shoot VCOIs to healthy people and have them have a short line of defense against this virus. Or maybe it's flu season and you want to get a VCOI shot to help you um, um, get over a flu, sh uh, flu uh, infection before it even started. So um, I hope I, I gave you a glimpse into what VCOI technology could do. I've mainly focused on viruses, but uh, bear in mind that this could absorb many other types of pollutants as well, including antibodies, toxins, prions, allergens. 
So um, uh, while this uh, platform in this slide here uh, looks large, it's even much larger than I've uh, uh, got into. So uh, to conclude, uh, this is our present, it was our past, but it certainly doesn't have to be our future. Thank you. <laughs>